you're here with Steve Portico. Steve, thank you for joining us today. And I wanted to start with the first question. Why is it so hard for people to do UX research or user research? Well, there's a couple of different ways I can unpack your question, so let me try both of them and see. One is, what makes what is it about user research that's hard to do? And the other is, why is it hard to get to do it? Mm -hmm. um, I'll try simple answers to both those, All and right. we can explore those. Uh, user research, I, and maybe they relate. User research is hard to do because it's um, it's like the difference between everyone knows how to jog because uh, you just do that when you're two, or whatever you learn to run. But not everyone can be uh, a sprinter or a marathon runner. It's actually a really highly developed skill set, I would guess. That's the, I don't know, a skill I possess, <laughs> but uh, it's built it from the outside. If you will, to a layperson, it looks like you're just applying that thing but doing more of it. So user research is watching people and asking questions and just being interested. Um, that's sort of how it looks from the outside. And actually to do it very well, you have to unlearn a lot of things you know about how do you listen to people, how do you ask questions, how do you follow up, how do you probe. We have all those as social skills and they get us through our days really well and our friendships and our relationships. But in a user research context, <coughs> in a user research context, that's a completely, that's not adequate. So there's a lot of expertise. So I think, uh, you know, not realizing that this is a special skill that has to be learned and developed and honed and goes against some of our, our normal intuitions, that's, that makes it hard. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I'm going to learn how to operate a band. So I don't know how to do that. I'm going to study that. Now I've got it. I can go and do it. It builds on, this builds on and reframes some innate skills or some learned skills. But I think that makes it challenging. Um, that also, I think, creates challenges in people that might want to uh, act on the results of user research because they might not necessarily think that this is anything, that it, that it takes time, that it takes skill, it takes training, it takes effort, it takes focus to do well. Um, so then I think you get a bit of a vicious circle where if you don't believe in its specialness and difference, then you don't allocate what it takes, and then you get crappy results, and then that doesn't build confidence, so it kind of spirals into more of a negative frame. I don't know. All right, I'm going to use my teleprompter here uh, for the next question. Imagine a startup or engineering team interested in learning about its potential customers' needs. What should that team know before they interview their customers? This is going to sound like a flippant answer, and I really don't mean it that way. Uh, what's, what is it that they, what's, what do they want to learn? What's the problem that they want to solve? Uh, I think we spend huge amounts of, of, of the engagements that we do in my company trying to get at what that is. Um, I just uh, uh, was recently in a meeting that followed on you know, several meetings, months of writing proposal statements of work describing what was going to happen, um, you know, and then we have tasks laid out in time and, and all these things, costs, deliverables, outputs, all the kind of project management stuff. Um, and only to go in and realize that what we understood to be a sort of a sketchy statement of the, the objective and the problem was sketchier than we realized and that the, the first step that they needed was to get everyone together and start facilitating an exploration of what is it that we want to know, uh, what is it that we want to do with that information, how's that going to change something in our business. Um, so I think, you know, the, my, where I would encourage groups to focus is to really drill down on what it, why are they doing this, and then what are they going to get, and then how is it going to address their problem. Right. What is the most basic advice you can give a UX practitioner who's dealing with stakeholders who don't understand or respect the user research process? I think it's... Um, you know, the way I would encourage people to think about it, and again... I'll just offer the disclaimer that I don't want to be flippant about you know people's careers and people's you know work situations. Um, if you're in a situation, if you're in a relationship and something that you value and you believe in that you bring is not respected or believed in, you know at least ask yourself the question: Do I want to be in this relationship? Mm -hmm. So if you're in an organization um, where you're not empowered to change the process that's being used to make recommendations for how problems are solved, if you can't influence that or dictate that as, a, as part of how you're positioned, what your positioning is, uh, it's at least worth asking the question, is this something that I want to persist in? 
if I can't be successful according to certain measures, should I move on? Now, for a lot of people in UX, um, you know, there's increasing uh, hype in the press about the demand for UX people. So, you know, I, and I don't ever want to tell people, oh, just quit your job and move on. Uh, but I think it's a it's a good time, um, you know, e economically with this field. It continues to grow and grow and grow. I don't think there's ever been a terrible time. Um, but I think there's a lot of hunger for that. So it gives you, I think, a bit of a uh, competitive edge and saying, well, I'm going to go where I yeah. can do what I believe in. So m my observation is that, yes, there's a lot of hunger, but when you ask people, um, people, I mean, our clients, mm -hmm. what is user experience in their mind? Um, you get answers that you probably don't expect. And yes, they want to do it, but they have their own perception of what should be done. So there may be hunger and open positions, but you know, when you when you really look at things, you understand that it's not it's not all about adopting, um, you know, advocating for users and, and, and things like that. Um, so I mean, a lot of us feel that we we want to be it's 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 we want the rush of being a, a change agent. So a lot of us stay and, and don't quit our jobs, and maybe we fight in other ways. Um, did you ever have uh, uh, challenges with customers that didn't want to do something you suggested um, for different reasons? Oh, of course, of course. Um, now, I work at, you know, at an agency, mm -hmm. so they're not going to um, engage us unless there's some belief there's some and some endorsement with someone who can sign a check mm -hmm. to actually do yep. it. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean that it's clear sailing. Um, you know, we certainly get uh, inquiries from people that are thinking about it, um, but lots of those projects don't ever become projects for me or anybody because they can't really get past the contemplation stage. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of exploring and considering, and there isn't really an appetite there. Um, but people that do sort of cross that line where we are engaged with them, we are working for them, um, yeah, we have, it's a constant, the word that wants to come out is battle, but I don't really mean it that way. I mean, I think that's part of the, the engagement is, you know, to work collaboratively and facilitate and, um, you know, we're hired for our expertise. This is mm -hmm. what we know how to do. That doesn't mean we get carte blanche to kind of come in and do it. We have to negotiate. Uh, often ideas that are different from how we might want to do a thing. And, you know, I mean, I'm speaking about a many, many, there's a very complex set of activities that might take place over 12 weeks. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do we send this email out and how do we have this meeting and how do we have an agenda and what's the sequence of things? You know, just even being in business with them is a, a negotiation down to how are we going to find users, talk to them, interpret that information, and then, you know, package it in a way that leads to their actions. All of those are uh, are up for grabs. Not always with everybody is everything up for grabs, mm -hmm. but I think there's no, there's few pieces. There's, there's some pieces where I think we have, in terms of, uh, you know, we're brought in to talk to users. So I think people believe we can do that really, really well. But you know, the whole context of that project is something that is, is negotiated. So they don't tell you how to talk to people, but they tell you everything else? Oh, sometimes they do tell oh, us. Okay. I mean, yeah, you, they're all, you always will find someone who, you know, you can always find a, you know, a negative story, about, you know, an incident about something like that. But for the most part, I feel like that's, you know, you know, I think we're offering, you know, 20 key skill sets. And, you know, that sort of support the entire, uh -huh. I made the number 20 up, but support this whole thing that we're trying to help with. Um, but we may be perceived as having two or three. So, you know, maybe we are negotiating right. those other ones. Okay. Um, many UX practitioners get emotional when they negotiate with their stakeholders. Uh, they feel underappreciated and frustrated. What can you recommend to these practitioners other than quitting their job? Yeah. What can yeah. they do? Well, first of all, I completely empathize with people who bring their emotion to their work. Um, that's, you know, true for me. I think positive and negative. It, it, it really, I, I get moved, I get frustrated, I get excited. Um, so I certainly wouldn't say not to do that. Um, and this, you know, I mean this, I mean this seriously. I know I think like therapy is something to consider. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, what's the boundary we have with our work and our, and our own identities. 
Um, and that's, you know, I say that advice for myself as well, that I think trying to find that balance around those emotions so that we can have healthy emotions around things we care about, but we can't, don't have to get sucked into it in a way that's unhealthy. And, 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 and if I think about people who I really admire that have talked about these issues, the phrase I hear over and over again is uh, that they treat it like a design problem. Mm -hmm. So you see kind of, uh, you know, in the UX community, every so often somebody with a bit of a public profile takes a job at an organization that seems to be, you know, unfriendly to design, unfriendly to user experience, unfriendly to customers, not doing well kind of brand-wise. Somebody takes a job there and then they'll write a little post about, you know, why I'm going here, why I'm going there. Or I've had these conversations over beer with people and they just, they tell me, look, you know, this, I'm, I'm now not designing the widget, I'm designing the organization. Yeah. And um, so those people are passionate, they are emotional, uh, but they're sort of separating their own uh, success from, you know, can I get a, can I get this thing to happen? And they're, they're looking kind of a longer term, bigger picture, and they know that, that design problems can fail, it might not work out, but that's kind of the experiment that they're in. So... Uh, I aspire to be that person, to be kind of dispassionate about it, uh, you know, in terms of the pain and the frustration, but also kind of gung-ho to solve the big picture. So, uh, you know, if you can model yourself after that person. All right. Um, so something you said earlier um, makes me want to ask you this. So do you ever check or come back to a client that you did a project for and see if they implemented anything? And if so, what happened? This, um, it's one of the toughest nuts for me to crack in my practice is, um, because I'd rather be in the relationship business than the project business. You know, yeah. that sounds like something that should be a tagline or something, but, um, I think the most kind of creatively satisfying work is where there is an ongoing dialogue. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not, I've not been successful in sort of building in a formal checkpoint think uh, everybody we work for is very, very busy, so just to get their time for the things that we need them for to complete our work is about all we can get. Um, so I sort of need to maintain those relationships, find other reasons to check back with people and hear what they're talking about. Um, I have been doing this enough years that I've had enough opportunities to reconnect with people and hear stories. Um, obviously, what the data set that I'm missing is the people that I never hear from and, and I don't understand sort of what the uptake was or mm -hmm. wasn't. Um, you know, often uh, I see uh, organizational changes happen, so there's sort of no, even though the company exists, there's no there to go back to. Um, you know, but I hear, you know, I definitely collect the anecdotes like, um, you know, we worked in the early part of the development of a new product and, um, you know, I saw that person a year and a half later. He said, oh, I went back to your deliverable, you know, on a weekly basis to kind of go back to things. Um, and that was helpful for me. And I actually could see things in the product uh, where we presented them, you know, you have to make a decision about this direction or this direction, but these are both strong vectors. Mm -hmm. And they went very strong in one direction. I could see it in the product. So, um, you know, the what I observed come out in the marketplace and what they told me, how it influenced them, kind of lined up. Um, but, you know, now... You know, it's looking for, um, you know, looking for chances to reconnect with folks and calling them up and saying, I have something to show you, or can you guys tell me what you're doing? And, um, you know, I, it's, I think like anything else, I probably get about 20% kind of uptake on those, on those outreaches. Um, but then sometimes they come back to me spontaneously. Someone will tell me, hey, I heard your work come up in another meeting. I'm like, what happened? What did they say? What are they talking about? And, um, yeah, it's been those are great when those happen. All right. Um, I want to ask you about uh, questions. So I find that people deal or obsess sometimes about our methods. Um, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? With all, with all of our crazy names for, for methods. Um, I'm not even sure that UX practitioners know, know the difference between an interview, a contextual inquiry, and, and ethnography. Um, and I'm trying to shift the focus from the methods to um, identifying research questions. And, like, you started with it. What is it that you're trying to learn 
What are the knowledge gaps that you have? What are the questions you're trying to answer? Not necessarily what are the questions you're going to ask users or, or customers, but what is it that you're trying to learn rather than how are we going to get that information? Do you still find people focus on, on the methods rather than the questions? Maybe less and less. Okay. Um, yeah, I wonder if you have this experience where someone approaches you and says, I'd like you to execute this study as opposed to here's what I'm trying to uncover. Definitely, I see that. Not always, not 100% of the time, but definitely you see people come and say, I want you to do a usability test for this, or I want you to do uh, the same thing you reported about a study, about study results. I want you to do the same thing for, for, uh, for our thing. And then we need to take a step back and right. ask. What is it that you're trying to learn? And usually, it's not a usability test that will answer the question, right. or, or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I see that happen. Although, with teams I work with for for a long for long periods of times, then that changes. They they now know that I'm looking for the questions, not for uh, they're not interested in the methods. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I think about that. You know, I think as um, again working in a in, a, in an agency context. Uh, I feel like we have two kinds of clients, ones that treat us uh, as vendors and ones that treat us as partners. Mm -hmm. um, and in contrast to the, um, the partner uh, relationships we have, when, when we're seen as the vendor, uh, those are different. The uh, time frames are ridiculous, the budget is ridiculous, their experience in doing this is almost none. Um, uh, the problem that they want solved is important to them. I'm not you know, negating the problem, mm -hmm. but um, uh, it's not it's not a uh, it's not a sexy problem. Yeah, it needs to get solved. Um, and of course, even you know when we go out to solve that problem for them, you find more. You can't help but find more because the topic is rich. Uh, their ability or even interest in acting on that is limited. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm okay with having a mix in my life because I think. Working with working as a vendor kind of keeps you honest and keeps you, um, you know, striving a bit to to illustrate the value. Uh, I think there's always kind of a yes and piece that we can do for them, and some of them will take it and some of them won't. Um, you know, I, I, I sort of question myself. You know, is one or the other more likely to actually act on what we yeah. find for them? I'm not sure. I have a you know, I, I know what the engagement is like, how it's different, but I'm not sure what the uh, the uptake is like. It might be, yeah. you know, similarly challenging in both. Um, so, uh, and, and I've, you know, I you, as a, an agency, you get sometimes the request for proposal documents that somebody has specced the whole thing out. It lists the cities, it lists the number of people, it lists the profile, and all they want from you is a number. Um, so that's almost even worse than being a, a vendor because sometimes in the vendor, you you, know, you still can talk to them about how to approach it. Now you're just kind of a commodity vendor, yeah. um, and it's it doesn't, you know, as much as I work at the pleasure of other organizations, I still feel like I want to be seduced a little bit. I want to get excited about their problem so that I can have my creativity yeah. engaged the most. And, uh, you know, a problem that's fully spec'd out. Uh, I had one client approach me, and uh, they had this document, and I did what I usually do, which is like, great let's have a conversation about it because now what I've learned over the past five or six years is that just because that thing got written through some purchasing process or planning process doesn't mean that's actually what yeah. they need to do and sometimes if I say have you thought about this they're like oh awesome let's do that so I try to get the conversation and not overreact to that document um, and uh, I got to the point where oh this person wasn't available we need the RFP responded to tomorrow uh, this person's available this time for 10 minutes, uh, then the person wasn't available, and uh, the email I got was from a person who had, it was just a junior person, had no insight into the needs. They said, send me your questions, and I'll have that person answer them. And I thought, yeah, this project, I can't be successful in this project. The, the whole notion of the relationship is not, is not right. So I've drifted far from, this far, far from your question, but... I mean, methodologies and, and negotiating the methodology is part of the relationship, I think. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I'm characterizing different approaches to that. Um, what is your approach to team members moderating customer interviews? 
not just asking questions in the end, but actually facilitating the whole thing. Engineers doing research. Um, I've seen it work well. I've seen it work well. Um, you know, that's probably a tool that's going to be used more by an internal team that's trying to, you know, socialize the function of user research. Um, and I, I worked with a company where um, they were doing, uh, they were basically creating a program where more and more people could go out to the field and meet customers because there was just no awareness of real people. Mm. Uh, and so everything they were developing was around that. So they... Um, they developed kind of a little training program. It was very lo-fi training. It didn't feel like training. Um, sometimes they had me come in and do it. I would talk for like 30 minutes about how to do it. Um, but so people would be brought out on teams, and then I think after a certain number of times, then you were qualified. And they didn't pick everybody. They kind of handpicked who they mm -hmm. thought got it. Uh, they would ask those people. So it kind of spread, and now they could serve a larger group by having more teams going out at once. Um, and I think those people, you know, spanned, uh, you know, job functions. Um, I thought that was great. I thought that was great. Obviously, you're doing something very different than um, a certain kind of deep dive where you need, uh, you know, if you're going to go as far as you possibly can and, and find the most nuanced insights, you know, you have to be, uh, you know, a deep specialist. But I think there's a lot of, we just don't know, we've got to go ask people. There's a lot of that stuff that would help development enormously. Um, so, you know, engineers or whoever, I don't really care what their title is, if they, um, they have the curiosity and the, and the empathy and can listen, uh, and are willing to kind of go through a little bit of apprenticing work, then, yeah, I mean, then let's just have more people doing that. All right. These are all the questions I have for you. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I don't think so. I think, I think right. we've covered it really well. Perfect. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.